Now then, Yuletide felicitations to all of our listeners, because even though this episode's going out in oh, fucking March or something, April maybe, we're recording it Christmas week, aren't we, Al? We are. Seasonal greetings, everyone. I'm Alison Barton-Simmons. Oh yeah, I'm Ex Benedict. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Too excited to get stuck into this episode because it's such a classic, isn't it? It is. It is. This is definitely the one that I have seen the most because in, in the UK it's pretty much shown every Christmas. Yes, I don't know if it is in America where obviously this is Good Neighbours. Um, but it was recently on in the UK and even though it's, what, 40, 43 years later, everyone loved it. Twitter was ablaze with mentions. It's 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 still nice to watch it, despite the fact that you can watch them on Daily Motion, you can watch them on DVD, you can watch them on Brickbox. Um, to see it actually on TV in the listings in the Radio Times, I don't know. There's still something magical about that at Christmas. Yeah, and everyone got into it, didn't they? It just yeah. seemed like everyone loved it. People were lamenting classic sitcoms like this one and saying, "How you don't get this stuff anymore." I know no. that's a little bit nostalgic and. Um, Rose tinted glasses, perhaps, because there are some good shows out there. But this is just such a lovely feel good episode, isn't it? It is, and I think this year especially, um, I know that in the in the UK, the the listings for Over Christmas were so, uh, just not the usual TV sort of offerings from the BBC yeah. or anyone really. So to see this, um, I know that we we sort of don't want repeats after repeats after repeats but this is definitely a repeat that you're happy to see in the listings i think yes not that i watched it on tv because i live in new zealand but i still enjoyed watching it yes do you want to know some anagrams of margot ledbetter oh yes please right okay here's some just random ones that i picked out treble rock damage wow drama goblet tree belated tram goer (laughs) Large Mott Debater. Oh, that's a bit suspect. I know, yeah. Mott is a um, minge, isn't it? It Irish. is, yes. Yeah. Large Mott Debater. <laughs> Mortal Tea Badger. Blamed Oat Regret. Bloated Rage Term. And my two favourites, Battle Armed Ogre, which is very uh, appropriate. That's good. And Aborted Telegram. They're all quite appropriate, actually. There's none of them that, that you think, oh, that's not really Margot. They're all very Margot-ish. Yeah. I wasted 45 minutes researching Margot <laughs> Ledbetter anagrams. Oh, we've also got Arab bag odour. <laughs> well, she did go to Africa on a holiday, so perhaps. Yeah. And it was Northern Africa. was, wasn't it? It was Kenya. Kenya. Tolerate bad germ. Did I say that one? No. Yeah. Greet a moral debt. Oh, Wow. I shall pay it. Right. I've got one for Jerry as well. Be a larder jetty. <laughs> Quite appropriate. It is. Anyway, that was just me killing time when I should have been watching the episode. Sorry about that, Al. That's why we're late. I like them. We're going to, because it's the last episode, um, apart from the silly royal one, which we will do, but I consider this canon the last episode okay to be honest but because of that we're going to do a little um two-way quiz aren't we where i we quiz are. you and you quiz me we haven't got a jingle we haven't we've got six questions each to ask each other to test our knowledge of the good life now that we're at the end we'll take it in turns to ask each other a question and we'll keep score and we'll see who is the good life champion eh hooray do you want to go first i will off you go then okay question number one ben Yes. Tom's Whistle. What is the tune taken from? Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Well done. Do you know what? We've talked about that in the past, so I wasn't sure whether you actually knew where it was from or whether we just talked about it. It is Somewhere Over the Rainbow. I only know that because I'd read it, though. I didn't ah, recognise okay. the, the way he whistled it as being that song, did you? Did you not? Yeah, I did. When I heard what the actual song was that it was taken from, it, it all fell into place, yeah. Okay, here's one for you. Okay. What was the name of Barbara's old school friend who came to dinner in the last posh frock? I've got four options for you, you might not need them. Do you want four options? I don't, think I, I don't think I need them. I don't think I need them. Go on then. Was it Eileen? Correct, it was Eileen. <gasps> Eileen with a busty dress. Yes. With how many buttons? <laughs> Five. She was fabulous. Uh, <laughs> your turn. Okay. I think you might get this one. 
What was Margot's nickname at school? Starchy Sturgis. Starchy Sturgis, it was indeed. Ah, oh, poor Margot. I um, know, because she couldn't she couldn't find humour in, in anything. And they all thought she was starchy. Bit like this bit like this one that we're gonna do today, really. She struggles. Oh she does. Bless her. Mm. Now, at its conception, the situation of this situation comedy was going to be different. So I'll give you four options. It's a multiple choice question. Okay. Originally, was the good life conceived to be set on a full farm, set at sea? Did they move to Australia and become ranchers? Or did Tom and Barbara open a whorehouse? I'm going to go for A, a full farm. Well, I'm reluctant to say no, because that was one of the ideas. But the very first idea was actually that they would go off to sea in a yacht to escape. What? That, that was that the one list. that I had at the bottom of the list. Really? Yeah. That yeah. Was, and um friend of the show, James Hogg, confirmed that for me on Twitter this week. Wow. Oh, no, I had, I had whole house above going on a boat. <laughs> I'd have watched any of them, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Just throw them all together. <laughs> Barbara as a madam would have certainly set my pulse a race. <laughs> On a boat. <laughs> In Australia. So, I don't know, I reckon you get half a point because they did consider okay. the full farm. Right, half a point for me, thank you. Okay, number three. Sir and Felicity have an unseen son who lives with his girlfriend. Oh, is he, no. Is he called A, Michael, B... Malcolm or C, Martin? Is the second one Malcolm? Yeah. I'm just on a hunch I'm going to go Malcolm. No, it was C, Martin. Oh, my dad's name as well. I know. (laughs) Never mind. Well, I'll give you one of a similar ilk, shall I? Okay. What was Penelope Keith's birth name? I'll give you four choices. Penelope Davis... Penelope Hatfield, Penelope Greenwood, or Penelope Pitstop? I'm going to go for Penelope Greenwood. Oh, it was Penelope Hatfield, I'm sorry. Was it? Okay. Yes. And Keith wasn't her married name, that was just her, you know, equity it's name. A stage name, yeah. yeah. There must have been another Penelope Hatwood. Was it Hatwood? Hatfield, Hatfield. Hatfield. Yeah. Hatwood just sounded very odd. Okay. Number four, Dickie Breyers has also voiced numerous characters and narrated shows on TV and film over the decades. Yes. Whose cartoon dad did he voice in the early 2000s? Cartoon dad. Bob the Builder. It was. He was Robert yes. the Builder. Yeah, it was Bob the Builder. I didn't know that until this week, you know. Really? I saw a clip of him talking to um, Philip Schofield about it. Bob the Builder's dad. I, and I remember seeing it because I, I have nephews who would have watched it when it was on TV. And hearing Richard Breyer's voice, and, it, and it's one of them that when you spot his voice, it's so recognisable. Yeah. That it, it being like, oh my God, it's Richard Breyer's. Well, he, he himself in this interview described it as basically being the same voice he did for Martin Bryce in Ever Decreasing yeah. Circles. Yes. So he didn't have to come up with anything original and he still got paid. <laughs> oh, amazing. And he sounds like the home pride flower man, Fred. It's just the yeah. same voice that he does for all all yeah. voiceovers, I think. He's like Kenneth Williams, he's got three voices. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> oh, now then, uh, okay, where, where are we up to? You've asked me four and I've asked you three, is that right? Um, I've asked you four, yes. The scores so far are three to one and a half to you. Is it? Oh, bloody hell. Right, okay. Mm. This is an integral question then. Yeah. Which incidental character in The Good Life have I fabricated? I'll give you four names. Okay. Ernie, Michelangelo, Colin, Ruth. Michael, Michelangelo was, was had Lombardi in there somewhere. You're right. That was the, the Runstable Spoon owner and manager. Okay. Are you trying to catch me out, or is that the one? Yeah. Because I think Michael- Michelangelo wasn't in it. Oh, no, Michelangelo Lombardi was the... Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. right, okay then, so not that one. Um, can you just run run them by me again, please? Ernie, Michelangelo, Colin, Ruth. I'm going to go for Colin. Correct. 
because we had Ruth, who was the young girl who fell in love with Tom. Yes. Um, and Ernie was the inept salesman. In the shop with the spinning wheel. Yes. So you got yeah. you got that one right, kind of. I'll let, I'll let that go. That little yes. Well, I was, bit, I was a bit confused. Right, so that's another one for me. Okay. Yep. Um, right, number five for you. Which supermarket chain did Penelope Keith reprise her Margot character for, giving voice to a shopping trolley? Oh, wow. I'm going to have to find that and tweet it out. Um, what decade? 90s. Right. Well, it's got to be like Waitrose then, hasn't it? Are you going for Waitrose? No, Marks and Spencer's. It was Tesco's. Oh, bloody hell, Marco's a Waitrose girl, isn't she? And she said she, she does the whole thank you very much. Well, I'll have to dig that one out. I'm glad to yeah. know that you found it because yeah. that's definitely one to dig out. I, didn't know, I did not know that, although all of the cast did loads of adverts, didn't they? They did. You, you sort of hear the voices all over lots of things, don't you? That was yeah. one that I remember, though, because it was like a, a, a trolley that spoke, <laughs> which imagine is very having, memorable. Imagine pushing the trolley around Tesco and and it judging you, you for putting much. the wrong things in Exactly, your and it would do, wouldn't it? It would tell you. God Not those, yeah. those. <laughs> okay, here's one, uh, which is a difficult one, I think. Okay. Which TV critic described the character of Margot Ledbetter as a meticulously groomed, flint-profiled ball breaker? Okay? Yeah. Uh, and because it's a tough one, I'm only giving you two choices. Okay. Clive James or Gary Bushell? Because I don't know any other TV critics. <laughs> I think, oh, I'm leaning towards one, but I don't. I'm going to go Gary Bushell. Oh. I think I've been lured into that, though. Sorry, it was Clive James in The Observer. Was it? In the 70s. Oh. Yes. I would have gone, I think I would have gone for Clive James if I'd been asked that question, because it's very well, I mean, he's very, no pun intended, he's writing for The Observer, but he's very observant. <laughs> he is indeed, yes. <laughs> like the character in this show, the, the one of Larby and Esmond's weird incidental characters, The Observer. Right. Okay, question six, the final question of, of my quiz. All right. How many petals appear on the flower behind the bird in the show's opening credits? Is it is it A, 14, is it B, 16, or is it C, 18? God, I'd have said about eight. So this, God knows, I'm going to go 14. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. It was 16. Got that many, really? Yeah. Maybe I'm judging it on our logo. How many is in our logo? <laughs> yeah. Did it look different? I don't know. I can't remember. Right, so you've got a chance to win this then if you I get have. this last one I just right. need. I just need a half at least in this next one. Uh, it's not a... It, well, it might be easy if you know the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Jeffrey Kendall, Felicity Kendall's father, mm-hmm. changed his name to be after the town in which he was born, meaning Felicity could have been Felicity Male, Felicity James, Felicity Twist, or Felicity Bragg. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to guess Felicity James. I'm sorry, Al, it was the last one. It's Felicity Bragg. Oh, I, tried I thought to... you'd put that in there. I thought you'd just try to throw it for me. I tried to make one obviously wrong, Felicity Mail, because that yes. was because Rick Mail was always wishing he was married to her. Yes. Because he famously Aww. did that poem, didn't he? Felicity, you fill me with electricity. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Ben. You 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 beat me by half a point with three out of six. I don't think either of us can take much pride in this. We've just obsessed over every single episode yes, I don't <laughs> and got fifty percent of the most right. Oh dear. Yes. But it was fun. It was silly, but it's fun. Exactly. And on that note, let's get stuck into this episode, eh? Let's do that. Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. So this Christmas special, lest us forget, 1977, was it broadcast on Christmas Eve, I think? Or Christmas Day? I think it was Boxing Day. Boxing Day 77. Okay. 
It opens, doesn't it, with Barbara doing some origami. Well, she creates her own Christmas decorations. Oh, they're so cute, the little robins. Although Tom thinks they're vultures. He does. <laughs> for some reason. And it turns out she got so carried away, she decorated the chicken house and the goat pen as well with these things. Because they should be joining in, apparently. They should be enjoying Christmas too. That's the sort of thing Ali would do, I must admit. Decorate the pigsty. Yeah, everything has to be Aww. done right. Tom is also getting into the spirit of thing because he produces some stolen holly and mistletoe as well. Barbara's not happy, though, because she thinks that he's been just like lopping things off at the golf course. Well, he has, I think. Yeah, but everybody else was doing it, though, so Tom said that's all right. Well, if we believe Tom, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've never actually seen real mistletoe, have you? I don't think I have. I've seen plastic stuff, but I don't think I've ever, ever, ever come across it. No, it's just plastic stuff that leches wave around at Christmas parties oh, usually, no. isn't it? Yep. Jerry, I'm sure, has some in his desk drawer. Big stash, JJ. yeah. <laughs> Tom's also stolen a twig for a Christmas tree. I did, I did quite like the way he brought it in. That, that made me laugh a little bit. But yeah. he was trying to lug it in as if it was like some massive Christmas tree. Our first Christmas here in New Zealand, there's so many trees that look like Christmas trees out in the out in the nowhere. Yeah. I, I said to Ali, I'm going to get a hacksaw out the garage and leave the house at 4.30am and go and... Just go and get one. Yeah. But I didn't have the balls to do it. <laughs> I didn't want to be prosecuted in my first month in New Zealand. No, no, not with it. Barbara's also made a big robin, which is a bit suspect. And a Yule log. I thought it was very cute. I liked the robin. We have robin. a lot of robins here, yeah. Because my little girl's called Robin. We tend to have a lot of Christmas decorations that are robin related. Right. We just do. We just do. So I would have. I'd have loved the centerpiece of the of the robin on the log. I might try and recreate that one year, perhaps. Do you, are you big on the Yule log? Are you? No, not really. No, um, I don't. I don't think we've had. Oh, we, we had a chocolate Yule log for our pudding this year. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I produced yeah. my own Yule log after Christmas dinner. <laughs> that's about as much as it gets in our house, I'm afraid. Has it got snow on it? <laughs> Ooh, what would that be? Is that... Ill, poorly. <laughs> Taking cocaine through my through my arse because of the nerve endings. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a 999 job, that, I think. Yeah. Maradona's Christmas. <laughs> um, now, so the good start... F- play fighting and basically dry humping in the corner of the kitchen. They do. They? And, and then, they're in- interrupted. Yeah, interrupted by Margot. She arrives. She's in the midst of one of her many crises because a tradesman is playing up and the goods are summoned over to effectively to arbitrate, aren't they? They are. She still does the good morning, Tom, good morning, Barbara. Well, she has to interrupt them from bloody dry humping <laughs> in the corner. It's, really... <laughs> it's only polite, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah. It's me, Margot. So we cut to Margot's lounge where a tradesman is sat there singing to himself. He's one of these very, very odd Isn't he? Esmond and Larby characters that are just turn up and are just fucking weird. Don't mind my asking, but uh, do you cut the hair in your ears? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was born like it. And I happen to notice how short they are. I notice a lot of things, you know. It's a sort of hobby of mine, observing things, you know. Oh, yeah. In the Observer Corps, were you? No, oh. RAF. RAF? Oh, I was on the RAF. You know who RAF line, am I talking? No, it, I was stationed there. No! I uh, hate to break up this reunion, but I think Mrs Ledbetter wants us to concentrate on her tree. Thank you very much, Barbara. <laughs> I mean, what, oh, who talks to people like that? I was, you know, had a thump in the face for just being so weird. I love the eccentric characters they come up with. Like, they just make they're me smile. They're always so ex- they're so extreme, though. There's nobody that just comes in and says like, "Oh yeah, here's your delivery, Mrs. Ledbetter." Bye. They I always have to come in with some nonsense. Apart from Mr. Coles, our hero. Oh, I love Mr. Coles. He was fairly normal. He was. He was. David Batley that played the um, tradesman Bill. He's recognisable, isn't he? He's someone that I've seen. On the circuit. I looked him up on IMDb and he was in all the bloody usual things, but I don't know yeah. what I would have recognised him from necessarily. He's, he's someone that you've seen, though, sort of like countless times, I think, isn't he? Yeah. He's an observer. Observational man. 
He is an observer. Um, Margot's not happy with him, though, because she ordered a Christmas tree that should have been nine foot, but instead it's eight foot five and three quarter inches. Oh, my goodness. And the, it literally hit the fan, didn't it, because of that? Yeah. She can't. She cannot abide her tree being six and a quarter inches too short. And she oh, sees dear. this as a sort of um, s- symptomatic of the slipping standards of 1977, yeah. doesn't she? I've got to kind of just make a point here. Um, to when when she asks Tom to measure the tree, and he does, he says, "I haven't gone metric yet." Oh, did he? No, despite the fact in the first episode, I was discussing that draftsman and sort of architecture was one of the first industries to take on the the metric system. I remember. Um, yeah, he says that he's not. No. This is the type of content that we're here for, isn't it? This really it is. Anal this is the deep deepest dive. of deep dives. Yeah, I am now concerned about the metric imperial um, <laughs> <laughs> measurement systems of the nineteen seventies. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, no matter whether it's in inches or centimeters, Margot's. It's too short. It. No matter. Too She's short. Not having it, and nope. she basically refuses to accept any of the other stuff from the observational tradesmen until such a time as the entire order. Meet spec. Oh, it's risky, that, isn't it? She's, she's proper risking the fact that it, she might not get it. Fool but she assumes She f- fully assumes that they will put this right. Yes, more fool her. I mean, it serves mm. her right in many ways when they don't, doesn't it, for being such a bloody stickler. Yeah, Christmas Eve, you just don't do it. No. You she's just accept whatever you're given. She's almost asking for it here, Margot, I think. Before the observational tradesman leaves, Barbara wants to know if the observer has observed anything about her. Uh, have you observed anything about me? Yes, I have. Your eyes. They're the kind of eyes a man could kill for. The sort of eyes that hint at a deeply sexual nature. Merry Christmas. (laughs) Was it a sexy eyes? Yeah, eyes that a man would kill for, I believe. Of a very sexual nature. So that was another curveball from this oddball, yes. eccentric character. Jerry arrives, doesn't he, looking fed up? Oh, he is. He's not a happy Jerry. He's, he does not look forward to seeing the, the Pony Society, the Music Society, the Rotary Club, and then he's got to go to Cheltenham on Boxing Day or something. He's got a full agenda of a Christmas. When most people are literally putting their feet up, he just seems to have been scheduled to the nth degree by Margot. Yeah, and all he wants, as he says, is half a pound of peace and quiet. Oh, poor Jerry. He's decidedly frosty towards Margot. He's not happy, and he sulks off for a bath in the end, doesn't he? I wouldn't have thought it possible to inject so much bile into such a simple word as yes. Well, I'm fed up with all these blasted arrangements. More like a NATO conference than Christmas. I'm going to have a bath. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. Whilst you are indulging yourself with a bath, you might remember who's left to make all the arrangements. It's not. So back at the goods, Barbara's decorated her twig. She has. She's got wool, little wool strands all over it. It looks very pretty. And then for some reason she decides to hide from Tom and scare the shit out of him when he comes into the house. But I think that's because she wants to know what a present is, isn't it? Yeah, he's got a box in his hand and she's thinking it must be her present. So she's desperate to find out what it is. But it isn't. No, no. And then when he tells her, she she gets really cross about what's in the box, <laughs> yeah. ridiculously. But it's the crackers. Yeah, um, homemade crackers that Tom has made. Now, do you think that using a toilet roll tube, which Barbara seems to find ingenious, that's <laughs> something that, I mean, has surely inspired a million art and craft lessons since. I mean, everyone does it and has done. Yeah, I remember making um, crackers with toilet roll tubes. I wonder if it was a thing prior to this episode of The Good Life. Were people doing that beforehand? I'm wondering if Tom Good invented it. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, he's just certainly a very innovative man. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if they existed. The toilet roll cracker existed that could be the genesis. 1977. That could be the genesis of the toilet roll cracker. Maybe we'd seen history in the making. And I must admit, with those toilet roll crackers... If I ever made one and brought it home, we'd go bang when we pulled it as well. Yeah, exactly. You can, you couldn't do a... I think they sell them now, don't they? They sell the actual bangy bit out of a cracker. Now you can buy them separately. But I can yeah. imagine at their at their invention in the 70s, um, yeah, you would have to just go bang. 
But now these toilet roll crackers are de rigueur, so let's credit Tom Good with, with the invention yeah. of that. Let's give it to him. He's even written his own jokes, which we come we see later on, don't we? <laughs> um, so the Goods sit down with some Peapod wine, which is back to normal colour again this week. This it is. fluctuating colour palette <laughs> that we have for the Peapod. Yeah. And they work out what they spent on Christmas this year. What was it? Oh, it's an astronomical 15p. Yes. Wow. Amazing. Even 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 with inflation, that's not going to break the bank, is it? pound fifty or something, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so they just sat sat there, just chitter-chattering about how much the Leadbetters have probably spent. And I think Tom fat shames Mrs. Dooms Patterson. He does, <laughs> and there's, 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 there's goose envy as well, because there, there was a spare goose going at the Leadbetters and having... I can't imagine that the the goods have got any kind of sort of spread going on on Christmas Day. Ooh, I, I like, like Richard Bryers. I like Richard Bryers. I like Richard Bryers. I like Richard Bryers. So it's Christmas morning, and we see Margot on the phone, don't we? As ostensibly, she's extricating the Ledbetters from all of their social engagements at this point. Yeah. Because Christmas has not been delivered to this <laughs> So having sent it all back, nothing has returned. Nothing has been replaced. And so they're left with absolutely zilch. Very iconic lines that she has here, though, aren't they? With the Yuletide mm. felicitations. And absolutely, Christmas yeah. is cancelled. Yeah. Oh, I'll they're out of circulation. I quite like that. The Ledbetters are out of circulation. Uh, hello, Maria. Yes, and Yuletide felicitations to you. <laughs> Listen, Maria, I'll be as brief as possible. Absolute chaos. Jerry has chickenpox. <laughs> yes, he, he's, he's covered in them. Well, I'm afraid I'm telling you what I've told the rest of the gang, dear. The lead betters must be considered as totally out of circulation this Christmas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, just a moment. All right, Jerry, I'm coming. That is Jerry. Calling from the sick bed. Yes, I will. Yes. Goodbye. I love when she says Jerry's got chicken pox. Jerry starts actually checking himself for chicken pox. He does. Pox. I quite liked his the, his comic reaction of Paul Eddington in this scene. Is it really did tickle me. And when she's when she's like shouting off camera um, to the imaginary Jerry that's on his sick bed, um, Paul Eddington's looking up where she's shouting to. Yeah, he does bewildered acting better than anyone. He does. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So rather than take um take responsibility for what's happened. She's blaming the trade unions and blah, blah, blah. Typical yeah. Marga. Uh, but Jerry's just pretty happy that they can have a quiet Christmas with each other, isn't he? He's happy until he realises that the booze <laughs> delivery hasn't come in the van either. Yeah. What's he going to drink if, if there's been no delivery? Low gin. Well, he, I mean, he says, we can just have a quiet Christmas. And Marga asks, with what? And he says, each other. And Marga replies, eating and drinking what? And for a moment I thought he was going to say... Each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some kind of weird after dark. Yeah. The good life. Yeah. But yes, the last thing they need at this point, I would have thought, is Tom and Barbara turning up and singing oh. We Three Kings. I'd have glassed them, I think. Yeah, banging on the patio doors. But having said that, they do come in and save the day, don't they? And they invite the Ledbetters um, over for Christmas dinner. It's not out of duty either. They just, they're only too no. happy to have them over, aren't they? They are, despite having nothing, it's like the more the merrier, isn't it, with the goods? Yeah, although Tom does make sure oh. that he gets all of Jerry's liquor before he leaves. <laughs> oh, yeah, just clears out that trolley. Yeah. Well, if you were going to be drinking Peapod all day, you probably would as well. Yeah. I wonder if he makes oh, his own God. spirits as well. We only ever see him drinking the Peapod, but I was talking to a mate of mine in the supermarket the other day, and he's making beer here now, and he, mm. and he reckons that since the 70s, this is a bit of a off topic but home brewing has come a long way and, okay and it tastes amazing now i mean he would say that it's his bloody brew isn't it but yeah mm-hmm. if i wasn't a teetotaler i'd try it myself <laughs> for there yeah. you go in the 70s i can only imagine that spirits were awful if you tried to make oh, them yourself God. yeah i bet there were loads of people that like nearly blew their house up mm. moonshine yeah oh geez Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. So later that day, we see Tom and Jerry sat in front of their fire, 
sated with their full bellies and they're just nicely full and just content, aren't they? They've just got that Christmas glow about them. Mm. Tom bursts out the crackers that he's made and they all have a go with them, except Margot's a little bit reluctant to join in, isn't she? She certainly won't say oh. bang. No, she has to say crack when it's her turn. <laughs> yeah. Because crack is more pertinent and it is the stem of cracker. <laughs> yeah. So she's very much, you know, on on topic when she's discussing which word to use. You would have thought Margot wouldn't like the word crack. <laughs> maybe it didn't have those Perhaps. connotations back in the 70s. I was going to say, maybe, yeah, maybe in the 70s it wasn't as 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 recognised as meaning bum. Mm. Yeah. Someone said to me the other day, I was bent over my, I had three inches of crap. Yeah. And uh, it was an English guy I was with, who's also in a band with me. And he said, oh, I felt, I thought, I felt like putting a quid in there for a minute and seeing if I could get a jackpot. <laughs> Oh, see, I'm a bit cheaper. It would have been two P's for me. Uh, you're on the two P slots. Coining. I'm on the other two P slots, me. Yeah, or oh, it's where to park your bike. That's the other thing. The old Billy Connolly say. joke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to park my bike in there. The thing is, when you're a big fat bastard like me, you can't help have your crack sticking out. It's, it just happens. I get fed up people pointing it out, yeah. It's just... <laughs> Like, so we, you don't get loads of money in it, though. <laughs> and I've got, I've got a double, I've got a double crack. I've got. I'm going to draw you a picture. Not that this will help any listeners, right? Here's my ass. I'll draw it. For, well, I could get it out and show you, but I'm sure you'd rather I didn't. Just draw it then. My ass, my ass goes up like this, but then at the top, the crack goes off like that. It goes off. Can you see at the top? Why it's, does it do? Why does it do that? I think it's fractured. I think eventually, <laughs> fra- eventually the you- the crack's going to keep going. And a big, a big chunk of my arse will come out <laughs> like a piece of. Um, it's like a fault line. Like a, like on a, uh, what are they called? Like an avalanche. Yeah, it'll, it'll just slip and fall down. You'll find it in your pant leg. My entire buttock will come off like a <laughs> joint of ham or something. I'm a bit worried about it. It's, it's got all wonky, wonky crap. Wow. I think you should probably go to the doctors. Or embarrassing bodies and see if I can get a few quid. Or do that. Oh, I'd, I'd watch that. I'd do a, a deep dive. Not to so disgusting. I'd do a deep dive on that. Deep dive into my ass. <laughs> well, good luck with that. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jerry. Margot's hat. Margot's hat in her cracker. Yep. She's very perturbed by the fact that it's the Daily Mirror and she doesn't want to put that on. Of course she is. She's not happy and she has to swap with Tom for the Telegraph. I think she's, he's got the Telegraph, yeah, yeah which that... she's more happy with. Come on, Mama, get your hat on. <coughs> this is the Daily Mirror. <laughs> I am terribly sorry, Margot. Please, have the Telegraph. <laughs> Yes, uh, so they all don their homemade hats and read the jokes. And we they get do. M- another classic Margot line where she reads the joke. Now, then, my motto. The ooh-ah bird is so called because it lays square eggs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't understand. <laughs> She doesn't get it at all. No, everyone's falling about and she's she's just so confused, one, by the joke and two, by the fact that they're all rolling about laughing. She's just not getting into the into the spirit of a good of a Tom and Barbara good Christmas. She yes. she wants to do things like bridge, whereas they want to do blindfolded jelly feeding and sardines. Yeah. Although sardines is a bit middle class. Well, they are middle class. Yeah. The... Um, even when they suggest a game that involves running about, she says canasta. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what that is. What is it? No, I don't. But it sounds it sounds like it's something that's played with a board, perhaps. Isn't it what you put what an, an ointment that you use to treat an STD? Is that <laughs> that's can- canistan oh, can- <laughs> for thrush. <laughs> yeah, that's a different thing, eh? <laughs> canasta. <laughs> Um, <sighs> Jerry tries to explain to Marco that being silly is part of the fun. Oh, and, um, that's wasted, isn't it? She doesn't do silly. No, you can see the sort of forlorn look in Jerry's eyes as he's 
He's had this conversation with her many times, you expect. Yeah. He's never going to go in. But, of course, at this point, we get the two couples splitting off again, like we did in the oh. episode where they swung. Margot and Tom depart to the kitchen, leaving Jerry and Barbara. And Jerry's just blatantly trying to canoodle with Barbara. Yeah, just sort of faffing and pulling her hat down and messing. Yeah. Yeah. Tom gives him a look. And then he goes into the kitchen. He gives Margot a good talking to, doesn't he? He does. He does. He looks a bit sinister at first when he comes through the door. I just thought, oh, my God. Mm. Like some kind of pest. But he's, I think his heart's in the right place. He's basically just saying, like, just make the effort and you'll have fun. And you don't need to necessarily understand, but just go with it. Mm. it you know, my girl's very cute. She's very vulnerable again, isn't she? Because she explains her dilemma... She doesn't understand, but she says she will try, and I think it's yeah. a very sweet scene because Tom isn't being the usual dickhead. He's 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 actually trying to yeah. involve her rather than ridicule her. Yeah, and it does get fun from now on. Well, it does, but they they're all playing balloon games, and you get the sense that Margot is into it out of competitiveness rather than <laughs> rather than the spirit of fun. When she takes her earrings off so that she can join in with like more more oomph. Mm. Uh, Margot eventually declares it to be the best Christmas she's ever had. That's so cute. It's a lovely little... Um, the ending's just so lovely, really, isn't it? It is. It is. It was almost like a nice completion to the end of the last episode when they're all stood around and toasting the good life. But yeah. if this was then going to be the last episode, which presumably at this point they thought it was, mm. it was also a nice ending because it focused on the importance of friendship and... They're there for each other. Yeah, they even make the point that yeah, that Margot comes round to the idea that you have to make the Christmas yourself. It's not something that comes in a van. It's about being with friends. And then the icing on the cake, we get the exchange of the gifts, which are both yeah. brilliant gifts. The goods have they are. the goods have presented the Ledbetters with some nettle green jumpers. Yeah, misshapen. They are, they're just like oh yeah, they're huge, just aren't they? Monstrosities, aren't they? It's a lovely call back to the previous episode. I liked Jerry's line, though. Jerry's sort of really um, a good friend about it. Very diplomatic. He says, yeah, he says, for the right occasion, these will be the perfect clothes for the right occasion. And mm. I thought, that's very diplomatic and sweet. Mm. And then, of course, we get the um, the Ledbetters bring in the present for the goods. It was a very Ledbettery gift. It was personal, it was thoughtful, and it was grand. Yeah, but it, surely it was a bull and not a cow. They could have used a cow, <laughs> yeah. and he gave them An a bull. Actual <laughs> cow. I mean, what are they going to do with a bull? Are they going to get it to fucking impregnate the pigs and create a new breed of animal? Exactly. There was a bit of a, yeah, bit of a continuity error there. They could have just brought in a cow, but yeah. no, it was a full-on bull. Yeah, I thought to myself, maybe it was to sell sperm. Maybe it was to sell bull sperm. Oh god. Maybe it's like a sideline. You can imagine if they'd had scenes where they had to show them cleaning out. I've spoke to horse owners about how uh, a stud owner, guy, right. I used to, guy who used to be my boss, and he had to clean the um, helmet on the penis of this horse, peeling like smeg off the bell oh end. Oh my god, that is the worst job I think ever. Yeah. Surely, <laughs> well, that's got to be up there as being the worst job. It's yeah, I can't think of many worse, but yeah, he just seemed to take it in his stride. <laughs> so I wonder if that's what Tom and Barbara's life was like after this with the bull. Oh, just scrubbing bull willies. Oh <laughs> my god! But it was very thoughtful of them. Typically, I don't know. No, <laughs> no. Well, maybe <laughs> keep your bull. And there we go. That's the end of the episode. A belter of an episode. It is. It was. Anything else you want to talk to in this one? There was definitely allusions to swinging, I thought, again, a little bit. There was. There was. There was almost a possibility again of um, them pairing off. Yeah, but they hadn't had enough Peapod in this one. No, no. Jerry Jerry and and Barbara, especially. Peapod is the conduit through which which swinging will arrive via Epsom, I think. There was no mention of last week's crisis and a nice wrap-up, which is no. the only criticism I would have because they were destitute and the house was ruined. But Yeah, it was all right again now. And it was back to how it was pre-vandalisation. Yeah, no naff off on the wall. Naff off and the, and the wonky swastika. 
Was there a swastika? Was the last week? There was a, there was a badly drawn swastika. Yeah. Bloody hell! It was yeah. With you know, like when the bits aren't pointed in the right directions. Yeah, it was it was proper wonky. The Serbian neo-Nazi society were the ones behind the robbery, were they? Must have been. Did they not put they put wrote fascist as well on the wall of Tom Good's house. Yeah, fascist. Fascist, and then they dotted it with a swastika. <laughs> dotted the eye with a swastika. I mean, what? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't that wasn't well thought through either. I don't think. No. So, so did you have an MVP in this Christmas special? I. Oh, I did have an MVP. I think my MVP for this episode was Jerry. Okay. Jerry is my MVP just because I was really pleased that he got his the Christmas that he'd always desired, mm. which was non-fussy, with friends, just having a laugh, and the fact that he got to see his wife having a good time as well. And I know that was down to to Tom sort of making a just chill out a little bit but I just yeah for me it was just Jerry well for me I really struggled because I thought all four characters were good in this yeah they all had some good lines and Mm. they all showed their better qualities shall we say in the end I've gone for Margot again yeah well I wrote down Margot slash Barbara because I was tempted to give it to Barbara okay but I think Margot because just she has so many iconic lines in this one you know Yuletide felicitations and Christmas hasn't been delivered and um, the ooh yeah. bird. I think I've given it to her on the basis of all the comedic lines that she had more than anything. Yes. But as a character, she also did give it a go when she was given a talking to. She likes it when Tom's firm with her, as we've established she before. She does, doesn't she? Yeah. Like when the um, the, the, the runt of the litter. Hmm. When, um, when Tom was bossing her around. Yeah, she does. She does respond quite well. So that's interesting because Margot and Jerry were are definitely the two most likely to win the award for MVP, and I've got a vote okay. each. So after next week's episode, the um, Royal Command performance, of course, we'll yeah. we'll reveal the overall winner. Oh, that's exciting! In the meantime, do you want to have a little jaunt over in the direction of Fashion Corner? Yes, please. Let's go. Fashion, fashion Corner. Fashion, fashion Corner. corner. Fashion, fashion corner, corner, fashion, fashion corner. corner. So early on in this episode, when Margot arrives at the Goods house and interrupts the, the comedic fumbling in the corner, uh, she's wearing this orange, brown and white print top and skirt. Now, it's kind of like, the, the pattern's like kind of like Rick Rack. Do you know what Rick Rack is? No. It's the kind of like wavy white thing that you can sew onto material to give like a wavy effect it's, yeah. it's just like a trimming it's a trimming so she's it's like orange and brown and white effect of that all over a yellow corsage which we're used to seeing now which she's got a corsage on everything this bright yellow flower on the front um, she does look spectacular and her hair as well her hair in, in this episode whether it was just because it was a special and she, her hair just looked fabulous in this episode it really did Barbara's cool specs also worthy of a mention later on in this episode Margot again when she when she sort of says that she isn't dressed for the occasion I'm not even dressed yet I wasn't sure if that was because she was whether they're her pyjamas or whether she just meant that I'm not dressed for the occasion yet I think yet. so that was her swanning she, around the house wear wasn't it I think it is isn't it like a swanning outfit and it's a pink like a salmon pink caftan pantsuit with very massive bat wings with another pink corsage. So she I think she does, she does accessorise, even if she's just lay about the house really, doesn't she? She just sticks on something. Very lightweight material because she was kind of her ass was chewing on her undies were chewing it up a bit. It was, yeah, she yeah. was eating that that pantsuit, yeah, yeah, definitely. Also just a quick special mention to Barbara's jeans, jumper and scarf triple combo. Um, in red, white and blue. Um, I think later on in, in the episode, she's got the jumper sort of just slung around her shoulders with jeans on and a white shirt. She just looks very classic. I, I, we've, we've said countless times that Barbara can wear a, um, a bin bag and would literally look cool and smart and cute. But especially in this episode, that those three things together, I think, even though it's Christmas, she just looked very, very cool. She steal the um, show, do you think, from Margot? No, no, not really. I Difficult think the, to do that. The salmon pink caftan batwing pantsuit for me. Yeah. In that episode. 
Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. Okie dokie. So, as we've mentioned, next week's episode is the 1978 Royal Command performance. Not a great episode from memory, but the enjoyable thing about it is when we watch the episode, we see the Queen and Prince Philip and possibly <gasps> others arrive and get introduced to the cast, don't we, before the actual episode proper starts. I don't think I've... I don't remember seeing this. I don't think I've seen it. Well, you'll enjoy it then. Yeah, you, fashion, yeah, Fashion Corner will include um, a lot of royalty next week. Oh, my God. At like the crown. The crown meets the good life. Yeah, and, and Richard Bryce comes on from memory and does a little sort of joking speech and introduces each of the cast members as they walk on. So I think we should judge their walks as well. Because it must be very okay. difficult to walk on stage in front of the watching royal family, you know. Oh, it's just weird. The more you think about the actual premise of this, it's just weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if there was ever any other any other instance of the Queen demanding another episode of a favourite oh. TV show be made. Oh, I hope she asked for another episode of The Young Ones at some point. Can you see she, that, can you? Before she drops off. Yeah. Would be the same without without Rick Mailer. It wouldn't. Oh dear. Actually, you know what I was watching the other day? Royal Family bloopers. All right. There's some brilliant bloopers with Liz Smith in. She looks like a hoot. She, I think she the, she was just so adored, weren't she? They they all loved her on that show. Yeah, but you don't realise how filthy she is. She was she was about ninety, yeah. and she's give it as good as she gets to the likes of Ricky yeah, Tomlinson. Absolutely. Oh, fab. I really miss Carolina Hearn, actually. Yeah. I actually re- quite regularly watch Mrs. Merton clips. Yes. They're so good, though, the, those interviews where she... What a creation she was. She was amazing. The bloody oldies in the audience are terrible, though, especially the the fellas. They're so sexist. <laughs> he's one of them, when Lorraine Kelly's on, he's like, oh, I feel like climbing into me telly and giving you one. <laughs> oh Steady God. on, old boy. Yeah, sit down. Oh, dear. So, if you are enjoying what we're doing, even though we've only got one episode left to do, um, you can still join us at Saddle Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, where we post out rare videos and clips. Uh, The Facebook page you can find by searching at Saddle Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our website, saddle.club, and you can also get more information there about us, read our blog, uh, listen to the episodes if you don't do podcast apps. Get in touch with us via email if you like at saddlepodcast at gmail.com and tell us all the things that we've missed. Uh, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, there's loads of adverts that the cast of The Good Life did and we've we've got a pretty good archive of those going now and we share them on social. So make sure you follow us to see lots of classic clips of all four members of the cast sullying themselves by adver- yes. advertising tat from the 70s and 80s. <laughs> it's quite good fun, some of that stuff. Other than that, thanks for listening. It may be March, but I would like to say Yuletide felicitations to you, Al. And seasonal greetings to you, Ben. And uh, we'll see you all next week for the last one of the series. Goodbye. I'll see thee.